Hi everyone, it's Texas from A2K, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Vision 360, Modeling Parts Inside an Assembly. Applications Engineer John Pitcher will be presenting for us today. Before we start, we just go through about A2K, We're all about fostering innovation through consulting and training. A2K Technologies plays a vital role in open infrastructure, building, mining, construction, architecture, and manufacturing industries reach the full potential by delivering complete technology solutions and support services such as education and consulting. We work with visionaries to shape the future of design and in turn enable them to innovation to minimize risks, improve productivities and achieve excellence. ATK Technologies is considered the business minder of choice and trusted advisor by vendors and clients. We partner with major software and hardware vendors to meet our clients' technology needs. We strive to exceed client expectations by understanding the challenges and delivering solutions through experience and innovation. We work with clients and companies of any size nationally and abroad. Over to you, John. Thanks, Dex, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, just a quick sound check there, Dex. Do you can hear me clear enough and okay? Yep, perfect, John. Thank you. So yeah, welcome along everybody. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar. Um, my name is John Pitcher. I'm an applications engineer with uh, A2K Technologies uh, and my main focus is in the mechanical space. So I spend uh, quite a bit of time in the inventor product and fusion and a number of other aspects of Autodesk's uh, mechanical product line. So my background is in manufacturing. I've um, been in the manufacturing sector for about, uh, well actually for all of my employed life and uh, yeah, doing various roles. I, I started my career as a fitter machinist and uh, mastered in CNC programming side of things. Uh, spent a bit of time in hydraulics and pneumatics and uh, machine tool design and manufacture. And for the past 13 or 14 years, I've been connected with the Autodesk line of products and um, yeah, supporting uh, the likes of Inventor and Fusion and a range of other uh, CAD CAM solutions. And also just over the last uh, 18 months or two years, I've been uh, focusing on the additive manufacturing side of um, the business world and uh, what, what a lot of people call 3D printing. Uh, we call it additive manufacturing in the, uh, in the real world because uh, we're not just 3D printing trinkets and things like that. We're actually printing componentry that is uh, ready for use within manufacturing systems. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, so yeah, welcome along today. We're going to be talking about one of the uh, very clever little CAD systems uh, that Autodesk have developed over the last number of years. We've got um, yeah a bit to talk about with regard to Fusion 360. Uh, it's a very uh, powerful CAD system in that sense. It's um, uh, it's a relatively new player on the block uh, in the sense of uh, it's only recently developed. It's um, yeah developed in the late 90s uh, and through into the 2000s. And uh, look, I guess the big thing with that, uh, with regard to CAD systems, some, uh, there's a lot of CAD systems out there that are quite a lot older. Uh, so I mean, most of you would be familiar with AutoCAD, which was developed in the, in the 1970s, uh, much, much older system. Um, and obviously Inventor even was developed in the, uh, the 80s. <clears throat> and quite a number of other CAD systems in the marketplace were developed uh, back in that era as well. Uh, the likes of Pro Engineer and um, Katir or Unigraphics or uh, many of the other CAD systems date back to further than that. Um, and look, having experience in the industry is, is very beneficial, but when Autodesk started developing Fusion, I guess they developed with a slightly different mindset. And that is that um, uh, with the 90s and into 2000s, obviously we became much more of a connected space, uh, not only in manufacturing, but in all aspects of engineering. And uh, there was a need for greater connectivity and collaboration between stakeholders, uh, customers, users, and uh, a range of different businesses. So Fusion was sort of built on a platform of uh, high-speed internet, I guess, and uh, being able to collaborate more effectively with, uh, with cloud drives and cloud storage and things like that. So whilst it's a, a, a somewhat of a new player on the block, there are benefits to that. Um, obviously, Autodesk have been in this, uh, this industry for many, many years, and uh, they could see the merit of, of driving a CAD system that was more collaborative in its approach and in the way it actually functions. So I guess that's quite an important part of, uh, part of things. Uh, back in the 80s, we were working with 
very slow internet, obviously. Uh, sometimes it was quicker to uh, go down and photocopy 10 pages and put them in the post than it was to uh, send them via dial-up. So um, certainly back in that era, things were a lot, lot slower. But um, obviously nowadays uh, we work with much greater internet speeds and we've got some um, really good functionality based on that. So you've obviously heard us, uh, or if you've been to one of our webinars before, we frequently talk about the future of manufacturing and the future of making things. And uh, really the reason we talk about that so much is um, basically because there's a need obviously to shift with moving trends and moving aspects of the market. And that's exactly what Fusion is doing in the sense of being very collaborative and cloud connected. And really that's happening today uh, in the world today. There's many, many tools out there and, and uh, certainly just even in the engineering or the mechanical space, there's a lot of data being transferred um, for different projects and different aspects of manufacturing. So having a, a high speed uh, collaboration tool, which is what Fusion is, uh, can allow us to work, uh, as they say in the, in, the, um, in the manufacturing world, we work less in a siloed environment. So we're not working with silos of information, but we're working with interconnectivity and uh, information being shared across uh, a whole platform. So lots of things obviously changed in the last 12 months with, uh, with COVID and some of the other challenges of uh, people working from home. So the need to be able to collaborate uh, effectively and smoothly and being able to adapt quickly to, to changes certainly has put a lot more pressure on, on all of uh, uh, the aspects of industry and especially manufacturing as well. Obviously we need to manufacture um, a lot more locally and uh, being able to capture that data and uh, share the various information through our, uh, our workflow is critical. So that's where really Fusion 360 shines. It's, uh, it's a system that is optimized to, uh, to be able to work in a connected environment and uh, being able to link with uh, numerous other aspects of, of your particular business. And I guess the main thing with that is being able to get your product to market faster and being able to process items in a quicker fashion. So just went through a couple of quick slides here about Fusion. Like I said, Fusion is quite a, a, a new CAD system in the sense of uh, whilst it's you know been in development for 20 odd years, it's certainly not 40, 50 years old as per many of the other systems. So uh, very much built on um, the current platforms of cloud sharing. Now you may have heard of a bunch of other tools that Autodesk offer with a 360 prefix after them. You might have heard of uh, BIM 360 or Drive 360 um, or even AutoCAD 360, which is basically an AutoCAD version that can operate in the cloud. So you could access that via your iPad or, uh, or a um, Surface Drive or something like that, or a Surface type PC. Uh, so there's some great tools out there for being able to, to do that. The great thing about Fusion is it sort of blends both of these options in the sense that we do have an offline scenario. So Fusion still installs an application on your local device, whether it be a, um, a PC or a Surface or a, uh, even a Mac. So it is a system that will run natively on a Mac. Um, it's a very, uh, very powerful little CAD system in that sense that it has functionality that can work on both Macintosh and um, Windows type platform. So I guess the, the big benefit though is that we can save files either to our local drive or we can save them by default as Fusion does into the cloud. So there's big benefits in being able to share your data with, uh, with different uh, aspects of your business or different elements of your, um, uh, of your workflow. So like I mentioned, the, uh, the, one of the great features of Fusion is that it, uh, it does work on a, a Macintosh operating system. Um, it does function uh, equally as smoothly on either Mac or Windows systems. And also I think what we need to understand is that it's not just a CAD system. It's also a CAM workspace. It has uh, tools for rendering and simulation. That means that uh, we can keep all that data together in one application. Obviously, we can create multiple assembly parts and uh, different aspects of assemblies. We can work in a range of uh, different 
environments as well. So we do have, like I said, a CAM workspace. We do have a rendering workspace. We've got simulation tools. We've got the opportunity to as well animate assemblies, create sheet metal components, and obviously create 2D drawings as well. There's also a very no another very powerful function is that we can work with T-splines and nerve surfaces in a, a freeform type system. So just to highlight again, and uh, sorry if this is a bit duplicated for those of you that have been there before, but uh, been to one of our webinars before, but uh, here's some of the key elements, I guess, of the Fusion interface. Um, we've talked about the data panel in previous webinars. And um, yeah, if you'd like to have a look at um, some of those previous webinars, I can, I'll perhaps pop the link to those in, um, in the comment section once this uh, uh, webinar gets posted online. But basically, this is the third sort of in a, a section, in a, in a group of four Fusion webinars that we're doing. So uh, first up, we looked just basically at the user interface and some of the basic functionalities. We then looked at just simple part creation and um, some aspects of creating parts within Fusion. Uh, we talked then in another webinar about um, modeling parts using teeth lines and nerve surfaces. So working with freeform modeling. And uh, today what we want to talk about is the next sort of aspect of that, of creating parts in the context of an assembly. And I'll be stepping you through some of the, uh, the various functionality of that as we go. So the really powerful thing about Fusion is that it has its own data management system. Um, if you save your files up to the cloud, it automatically revisions them up and uh, allows you to, uh, to track all your revision history. So very, very powerful tool. It's, um, the collaboration tools within the Fusion data management system are quite powerful. Uh, can link to other systems as well. So um, there is a uh, effectively a vault type system as well if you wish to place extra levels of security on your file management system. Now, with regard to security, and uh, Autodesk do have uh, white papers on the security aspect of all of their cloud service tools. So there's, um, there's some really clever uh, little aspects of that as well that, uh, that Autodesk certainly tick a lot of boxes for ISO standards, et cetera, for their security within their file systems. So what I'd like to do now is uh, slip over to Fusion and uh, give you a bit of a rundown on some aspects of working within Fusion, particularly, uh, as I said, in the assembly type environment and creating parts within the context of an assembly. So I've got a little vice uh, sitting here on my screen, a little machine vice or a, a drill vice, or whatever you might like to call it. And what we're going to do today as part of our little practice is uh, just model up a, um, a jaw to go into the, uh, the sliding jaw here that might be like a jaw to hold a piece of round bar or something of that nature. And uh, we'll work through some aspects of that. But what I thought we'd do first up is just clarify perhaps some of the uh, uh, the information about the user interface and what you need to be careful of when you're working within Fusion, uh, because obviously uh, when we're working in Fusion, there's a lot of little things with the uh, user interface that uh, that perhaps uh, you may not be aware of. So I thought we'd just run through quickly and apologies to those of you that are more advanced than this, but just to quickly explain one or two things. So I've got a couple of the, uh, the components of this little vice <coughs> um, showing here on my screen. So I've got the moving jaw open in its own little window here. I've also got the spindle, um, which is the uh, thread and the, uh, the, the handle to tighten the vice up. And I've got the full assembly open. Now those three files are all different elements in the sense that this particular item here is a single part file. What I want you to notice is the little icon at the top left of my browser here. Uh, you can see hopefully here, this is called Moving Jaw version two. And uh, effectively the little box there is indicating that this is a single part file. Now, when I jump over to the spindle file here, you'll notice that little icon is slightly different. Okay? It's basically designed to look like a group of part files. So the spindle itself is what we would call a component file because it contains these four items in, within the actual file itself. So because this contains four other parts, 
This particular item is what we commonly refer to as a sub-assembly. Okay, some of you may well be familiar with that already, so sorry if I'm boring you, but um, basically, if I go now to my full assembly, you'll notice I've got the same icon here, but notice down here I've got fixed jaw, moving jaw, and spindle, and again, the little icon to the left of the name here is intimating that this is a sub-assembly, this is just a part file, okay? And if I expand out the sub-assembly, here's those four components that are included in that sub-assembly called spindle. Okay. So that's probably the key thing when working with assemblies is to understand uh, that uh, those different icons. Like I said, this one here is just a single part. My spindle sub-assembly is a group of parts. Okay. And my top level assembly is a group of not only parts, but also of other sub-assemblies. So this particular assembly contains another sub-assembly called spindle. Consequently, the little icon here uh, that's showing that it's a group of other parts. So this could be what we consider a separate component, if you like, or a group of sub-parts or sub-components. Now, when we go to create a part in the context of an assembly, we can simply go up to the top of our browser here, right click on the body file and create a new component. Okay. Now, if I was to do that, and uh, maybe I'm gonna create a component and we'll leave it called component number two, we've got two options here. We've got an external component or an internal component. Okay. Now, I guess the simple way of explaining this is that the internal component lives in the design. The external component becomes a separate part, if you like, that could then be used in other designs. So if we were to pick OK here, Fusion would create component number. Actually, let's do that. We'll pick OK. You'll notice I'm now working in a sub environment and I'm creating the part called component two. And maybe that's a base plate or something like that that we're going to use to hold this particular item down. Now, I want you to notice one other key thing while we're talking about this is this little dot with the circle around it on the right hand side of the component name there. That's the active component. Okay, so previously you might have noticed the little dot with the circle was up here next to the body. Okay. So or in my assembly at this point in time. So if I was to go back here and click the dot in this window, I've now reactivated the top level assembly. So the body component here, which is my overall vice assembly, is now the active item. I can come back down here if I wanna do some edits to component two, and I can simply click the little dot in the circle there to activate component two to do some more modeling or or whatever i would like to do in uh, in that particular situation okay so we can very quickly and easily activate different components so if i was to click in the little circle here next to my spindle part okay you'll notice that uh, that i've got an option here to, to change to any one of these other components so i need to go back to the body first okay and now you'll notice that i can um, i can activate any one of these uh, other items in my assembly. So we can work within any one of these other items and uh, do edits to that as needed. So what you'll notice in my data panel, which we've explained in a previous webinar, which is basically my cloud storage area, uh, I've got these files all saved here now. And if I was to do a save on this particular file, in fact, I would see a component two appear, which is a blank component at this point. Um, and we'll be going into that in a little more detail in a moment in uh, future aspects of this webinar. So just to explain again, like I said, very quickly, just I've got the moving jaw open, which is part of my body assembly. Okay. Um, I've got the spindle open here, which is a sub assembly consisting of a group of sub components that we can uh, see listed there. And obviously this is quite important because 
when we come to doing a parts list or a bill of materials on our particular model at this point, these items are going to be quite critical that we see uh, the different properties of them. So what I thought we'd do is create, we'll create a, uh, a little vice jaw to sit, um, sit here. And uh, what we're going to do is, yeah, create a little uh, a soft jaw, perhaps, that we're going to put a piece of round bar in so we can drill a hole through the side of the round bar without it slipping out of the vise or moving while we, uh, while we do that. So let's go ahead and uh, we're going to right click up here. Actually, what I'll do just to save confusion, I'm going to delete this particular um, component too, so we don't get too confused. And we're going to, uh, like I said, right click here and create a new component. And uh, we'll create it as an external component at this point. And I've selected the vice as the parent, okay? And uh, we're gonna, rather than call it external one, we're gonna call it uh, soft jaw. Okay, for holding uh, maybe a piece of, of uh, 10 mil bar. So um, what we're gonna do now is, you'll notice now I'm actually in the context of this part called soft jaw. It's the active component at this point. Um, now what you'll notice is we've got our origin folder that we've talked about in previous webinars. Okay, so we've got all the origin features of this component called soft jaw. Basically all we're gonna do here is do a sketch on a face of our model. So I'm gonna select the front face of my moving jaw to put my soft jaw on. Okay, so you can see my grid there is, uh, is sitting on the face of our moving jaw. Now, all we're gonna do at this point is we're going to um, go in and project this outer face to create the shape for our, uh, for our fix, uh, for, our move, for our soft jaw, okay? So when we go to create a sketch in AutoCAD, when we select the face of a part, AutoCAD, uh, sorry, Inventor Fusion automatically creates or selects that profile. So if I finish the sketch now, I can automatically go and extrude this particular face, okay? And what I wanna do is extrude that by 15 millimeters. Okay, so we're creating our little soft jaw here in the, uh, it's going to obviously screw into our, um, our moving jaw. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna keep doing a little bit of modeling and, and uh, what I'm gonna do is do a little sketch on this side of my part and just draw a circle. Okay, and I'm gonna draw a circle here roughly of 10 mil diameter. Okay, and uh, what I'm gonna do is pop some dimensions on that circle now. So I'm gonna dimension it down from the top and we'll maybe come down seven millimeters and off the face of the vise, uh, we want to perhaps grab our, grab our bit of 10 mil bar by three mil or something. So we'll make this a two mil amount. So basically our little jaw is going to have a circular cutout in it so we can put a, a piece of 10 mil bar through there and, and hold it nice and firmly. So I'm gonna finish that sketch and then just simply extrude that shape. Okay. And I'm gonna change this to a cut so it cuts away. And I'm gonna go up here and select all and um, flip the direction, it's now going to cut through my jaw, as you can see there. Okay. So we're going to uh, just create a little cutout in the jaw now that allows us to hold a piece of 10 mil round bar or 10 mil pipe or whatever it might be. So we can successfully drill a hole through the side of that pipe without it uh, slipping in the vise. Okay, so I've created that, uh, that soft jaw and I'm quite happy with the way that looks now. That's, uh, that's how we want that to uh, to be obviously we'd need to do some cap head screws or something in the back here to uh, to hold our vice jaw on we won't worry too much about that today otherwise uh, yeah we can go into other areas that uh, that we don't need to so basically at this point now i can go back and um uh, you'll see that actually up here it's telling me it's working in the soft jaw part and that i've got a context there of the main assembly so what I can do at this point is um, uh, tick that little box and uh, now I can go back to my top level assembly and I've very quickly created 
a little jaw that is the same shape as my moving jaw in my vice, and uh, it now would be able to um, hold that, uh, that piece of round bar quite successfully. So if I was to go and save this file now, it, uh, it allows me to give it a version. So I'm going to pop in here, soft jaw added. Okay, and um, what you'll find now is that I've got another component pop up here in my, uh, in my data panel. And uh, today at 11.55, that particular file is being saved as a new part within my body of my assembly. So quite simply put, that's, uh, that's all there is to creating new components within the context of an assembly. I've done that and uh, successfully saved that particular file. Now, there is some other little aspects that I want to talk about in regard to this. And uh, basically, uh, as you can see, this is version one of that particular um, soft jaw, and uh, maybe that's all we need to do. Now, at any time, I can come back and edit the soft jaw. So I can click on the, the little option here to edit it in place. So if you, uh, if you select the soft jaw part and edit it in place, and maybe we, uh, we need to put some other little cutouts to clear the drill or something here, um, or whatever it might be to allow us to make our soft jaw work correctly. So we can at any time come back and edit the soft jaw. And uh, once we're finished with that, yeah, we can pick the tick here and it will take us back to the, the top level assembly for our particular component. Now, there's two or three other options for working with this. And uh, if I wanted, for instance, to um, create a new component from a body, um, I'm going to do this and we'll run through one other little process. So if I wanted maybe a, a plate to, uh, to fix my vice down so I could screw it down to my uh, machine table or whatever it might be, uh, we could go in and create a sketch in the actual assembly file, okay? And uh, we could create a rectangle that's um, yeah, basically a, a hold down point for for our voice, so we could uh, jump in and do this sort of thing. Um, again, we'll pop some dimensions on this just to make it uh, happy. Um, in actual fact, I might use some constraints. So we've talked about constraints again in a previous um, uh, webinar. So yeah, um, if you uh, would like to subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll find ac access to all of those, uh, those other webinars that we've talked about. But um, yeah, so basically we can pop in a um, yeah, bunch of dimensions here to make this, uh, this work correctly. So we'll just pop a dimension across here as uh, 30 mil or something. Um, all right, so um, I've, I've made the length of my base. In actual fact, what I'll do is I'll make it 30 mil from each side rather than giving it an overall width. We'll make it um, be spaced. Um, so yeah, basically we can place and uh, finish that sketch. So if this is going to be a piece of 10 mil thick plate, I can now go and extrude that to that distance of 10 millimeters. Okay, maybe this is my, uh, like I said, my little hold down component. Now, what I really want to talk about here is I can either make this part a, or, or this plate, I can join it to my body of my vise, but in the drop down here, I've got a number of other options. You're probably familiar with the, the cut option. Uh, the intersect option is an interesting one. We won't go into that in too much detail today, but uh, we've got the option here to create a new body or a new component. Now, a new component would become another part of this assembly. But if I, for instance, wanted to go and create a new body, for whatever reason, okay, if I select the new body option, you'll notice what happens up here in my, uh, in my assembly, you'll notice that I've got body one at the moment. If I go okay, you'll notice now I've got a second body. Okay, so that body uh, is now a separate uh, aspect of my assembly, if you like, a separate body in my assembly. 
and I can go and do numerous things with that body. And one of the probably the most important things is if you right click any one of these bodies, you can create a component from a body. Okay, so I guess to put up a bit of a, uh, a scenario for you, if I was modeling up a, um, a fuel injection system for a uh, motor car, I could go and do that in a multi body situation and then. Once I've done all of my bodies in my fuel injection system, I can go and create components from those bodies and, uh, and turn them into separate components, which are all interactive in the design. So that's quite a powerful thing, guys. You need to, um, and, and this is something we talk about in all of our training classes with regard to good design intent and top-down design technology, which... Uh, creates a, a lot of good interactivity within our component tree to allow us to work with uh, multi-bodies and multiple components within our particular assembly file. So we've, um, we've got a lot of functionality here with regard to the way we design. So rather than going and creating the individual parts that you can see on the left of my uh, on, in my uh, data panel there, we've got the fixed jaw, the moving jaw, the spindle, the body parts, rather than just creating them individually, we could create this entire vice in the context of an assembly. And basically what that would mean is that we create the different items as separate bodies. And once we've done that, obviously we can then go away and use this create components from bodies functionality to break that up into individual part files later on. And look, whether we want to put them, uh, pull them apart as separate parts that we're going to 3D print later on or get manufactured by, a, uh, by a, another company or whatever it might be, or manufacture internally, we can go and create those components from individual bodies that have been modelled up in the parent part. So effectively, what you end up with is a parent part file that is driving all of the individual subcomponents within your fusion environment. So fusion has some very, very powerful tools built into it uh, that allow you to, uh, to do that. It retains all the link information. It does all the things that, uh, that we could want it to do. And now, rather than having body number one and body number two in my assembly, I've just converted this to component number three. And I can go and make a change to this, uh, this particular part, file name. Um, so yeah, maybe this is the base plate part. And uh, perhaps if I need now to go and put some bolt down holes in that, we could quite happily go and pick the little dot in the circle to activate that part, pick up our hole command and create holes now for holding down our particular part. Sixteen mm hole is a little bit here. Um, maybe a 10 millimeter hole might be more appropriate. And as you would have found in uh, previous scenarios that we've talked about the different part modeling aspects, all of these part modeling aspects work very similar to how you would have used them in the past. So effectively with, uh, with the hole creation tool, Fusion is waiting for me to pick a reference edge and maybe I want that whole 15 millimetres in from these two edges. So um, okay. so we maybe want a countersink hole that's, um, yeah, um, 11 millis going to be, so that's a spot face hole actually, we'll make that five mil deep. One really clever thing that we can do about this, if we know what uh, what bolt we're using here, we can set up in, uh, set up Fusion so it automatically selects the uh, the size bolt we're going to be using, and it will counter bore or spot face or counter sink the um, the hole correctly for us. So you can see here it's picked up that the hole needs to be 18 millimeters to clear the head of an M10 socket head cap screw, and the default size for that is um, uh, 10 mil deep. So I only made my plate 10 mil thick, maybe I should have made that a little thicker. I could always come back and edit that though, so we can just simply accept the, the bolt hole. Now, obviously that's not gonna be a cap screw, but 
if I was to go in here now and have a look at um, my body under here, you'll notice I've got body one. I could go in and um, just edit that body and we could make a change or make a movement to that body to allow us to, uh, to work with that. Okay, so we can, um, we can go and edit or, or make changes to any of those items that have been done. And just bear in mind, this is all recorded down in your timeline. We've talked about the timeline in previous webinars as well. So, um, so you can see there, the timeline is recording the edits that we're making as we work through the, uh, the particular situation there of converting our part into a subcomponent. And likewise, if you've got um, uh, a part, so maybe this base component, I want to add the bolts to the, to the fixing point. I could just simply right click here now and create a new component in the base plate file. And that will, if I pick in here, uh, pick OK to this one, that will now turn that into a sub-assembly. Okay. So you'll, as we create extra parts, you'll notice now base plate is actually a sub-assembly because now it includes this other part. And like I said, maybe this is one of our, I haven't modeled this up obviously, but uh, maybe that's one of our hold down bolts or whatever it might be, uh, you can do that. So basically that sub-assembly is now containing other components within your particular fusion assembly. So really the, the key thing, a couple of key takeaways is to keep an eye on the little icon here. This is telling me that this is an assembly file. I've got sub components within the assembly, but I've also got a sub assembly. So the spindle file here is a sub assembly file. And here's the components that are included in that sub assembly. As you can see by the box icon, these are just single part files. Down here, we've added another sub assembly called base plate, which we use based on a body. So we built this base plate from the body file. And uh, basically from there, we've turned that into a sub assembly by adding another sub component to that, uh, which we've called bolt here. And we could add 10 other items. So we can just simply go and create new components. We could, uh, we could add other components to this particular sub-assembly from our data panel. So if you activate this sub-assembly and bring a part in from, uh, yeah, from another component list, or maybe you've got bolts, nuts and washers saved in another area, or if you would like to use the master car catalog, Okay, some of you may have been this track before where we can go in and pick from a range of different items. Um, McMaster Car is a, a big um, company in the US. Basically, they've got all sorts of hardware. So we can go and buy um, items from their, their um, online shop, if you like, and uh, bring in all sorts of different things for lifting mechanisms, for safety items. We can bring in Particularly, we'd be interested in um, things like um, bolts, nuts, and washers. So under fastening and joining, you've got all sorts of pins and rivets and uh, washers, bolts and nuts, etc. Uh, quite a, a, a large list of different items uh, that you could use for assembling uh, your componentry. So the McMaster car catalog is just another part of the, um, the assembly interface within um, within the fusion environment. Basically to use this, you select the cattle or the, the item you'd like to select. Um, so if you want a socket head cap screw, for instance, uh, this will go off to our website and I can pick any one of these different style of socket head cap screw. Okay, so there's a whole range of uh, different types here. You can also pick from this left-hand column and say, look, I want to filter by metric and I'm interested in an M10 um, bolt. So under here, I can pick from a, a stainless screw, I can pick from corrosion resistant, uh, I can pick a, um, a low profile socket head that might suit my uh, situation here more appropriately. But yeah, basically, we've got all sorts of different bolts, nuts and washers available to us in the master car catalog. And then effectively, you pick from this list, and you can select any one of these items with the hyperlink. 
And uh, we can then insert that particular part into our, um, our assembly by going down here and picking this little icon here for picking up the, uh, sorry, picking up the CAD file. So this will give you a list of all the different items. So here's all the different lengths I can get in black oxide or zinc plated. So if I want say a 30 mil long item, if I select on the part number, you'll notice here now I can go, so this is the little icon that I want to select, product details. And then I can just simply pop down here. It gives me a little drawing of, of that particular part. And um, I can go in here and pick whichever uh, system that I'd like to download these for. So I can bring them in as a, a range of different files, but if I was just to pick step file and go download, Fusion will then produce that part and bring it into my assembly form. So here's my little bolt that maybe I could pop into, uh, into our hole here and add that to my assembly. So basically you can see now here's that particular part which is included in my, my base sub-assembly. I've got my bolt now which again, we could assemble inside that, uh, that little hole that we, uh, we created earlier. So look, creating parts in the context of assembly, it's quite simple. It's uh, certainly not, uh, not too tricky. It's just a matter of following through those processes and uh, being aware of the links that are created when you do this. So um, you can see we've, uh, we've created yeah, a range of different items there. Uh, really, the browser is the key thing and understanding the, um, the different aspects of how Fusion behaves in, uh, in its uh, context there. So really, the, uh, the bottom line guys, is to, uh, to keep an eye on those little icons. And uh, like I said, you can certainly create uh, components directly within the, um, the sub-assembly. You can also um, create um, components from bodies, as I showed you. So quite, um, quite handy tools there for us to be able to, uh, to work through creating mechanical assemblies um, in, a, uh, in a fairly quick time. It's uh, certainly not, uh, not doesn't, isn't time consuming in that sense to be able to create uh, multiple items within the context of your, um, of your assembly. So look, I hope, uh, I hope that information has been valuable. It's um, certainly um, good to have you along and I hope what we've showed today is, has been of interest to you. We do obviously run um, a number of courses uh, on Fusion. So um, in actual fact, we run a lot of training via Zoom, a bit like this sort of uh, situation. And um, we've got uh, a number of... Um, Fusion classes coming up. We schedule these sort of every four to six weeks. So um, if you'd like more information on that, please reach out and get in touch. We'll certainly be keen to, um, to help out. Uh, certainly, uh, we do run quite a bit of training in uh, all aspects of the Autodesk software, uh, plus a number of other um, elements as well. So uh, I can tell you that we've got a Fusion class scheduled for the 7th of June. Um, I think that may be the next one. Uh, so look, yeah, that, that might be the one that's uh, most uh, the, the one in the future. So look, uh, do keep in touch. And um, like I said, we, we are happy to take a few questions. If, uh, if anybody's got questions and you'd like to pop them into the chat column. So in your Zoom, um, Zoom window, you'll have an option there to, uh, to uh, ask questions. So Dexter and I'll stay online for a moment and uh, I'll certainly be happy to, uh, to try and answer any of those questions if you've got uh, particular queries that you'd like, uh, like assistance with. So I hope what we've presented today has been valuable. It's um, been great to, uh, to have you along. So thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us today. And uh, on behalf of A2K, if you'd like to see uh, information on future webinars that we Run. We do run these webinars quite frequently on all aspects of engineering, so not just um, mechanical. We do run these for architectural engineering, um, electrical, uh, mechanical, obviously, and, and a range of other different aspects. So please go to that site uh, that you can see on your screen at the moment, hktechnologies.com.au forward slash events to see any of our future webinars that we'll be running. We will be running 
uh, the last in this series of webinars in a couple of weeks on drawings, creating drawings in Fusion. So it'd be great to see you along uh, to that as well if you would like to join us on that occasion. So again, thanks for joining us. Um, we will stay online for, uh, for a minute or two and uh, or for two minutes or so and uh, try and answer um, try and answer some of those questions. So, um, Salvi, thanks for your question there. I can see you've asked a question about converting uh, fusion assemblies to Revit families. Um, at this point, that functionality isn't available. We can do that via Inventor. So you could create a, um, um, a, uh, a fusion assembly, uh, take it through Inventor. Uh, Inventor does have the functionality to convert uh, assembly items to an OFC file or an RFA file. So you've got um, an option to go that track if you would like to. But at this point, uh, I think that functionality is being investigated via the BIM system. So um, certainly the, um, the functionality at this point is there in Inventor. I think it will probably be introduced in Fusion in the coming days. It's uh, the tool that's been in Inventor for a couple of years now, the availability of being able to convert Inventor assemblies to, to Revit, but um, certainly, uh, yeah, working with, uh, with Fusion is, uh, I don't believe that functionality is there that I'm aware of. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's not too far away though. So thanks for that question, Salvi. Thanks, Barry. I'm glad you enjoy the, enjoyed the webinar. It's uh, good to have you along. So yeah, more than happy to uh, stay online for another five minutes or so. If there's any other questions, do pop them into the, the chat section of your uh, your Zoom window. And um, yeah, like I said, thanks for joining us today.